This is Support of Sexy, episode 19, with TV executive Mitzi Miller. Welcome to the Support of Sexy podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so happy to have you here because you know it just would not be the same without you. If today is one of those days that you need a little bit of sunshine or you need a few laughs or you need some inspiration, this is the episode for you. I have it all for you in here because our guest today is Mitzi Miller. Mitzi worked in the publishing industry for many, many years. It's how she and I know each other. And she rose through the ranks at several magazines and landed the title of editor-in-chief of Jet Magazine. She worked on Jet for many years and then moved on to Ebony Magazine, which is a larger title um, in within the same company, though. But then Mitzi talks about getting to the point where she knew it was time to move on, but being trapped by what we call the quote unquote golden handcuffs, meaning you've got this position, you're making this money, you have this certain level of um, access when you're in these positions and you it's tough to give it up. Let's be honest. Sometimes it's tough. But Mitzi talks about coming to the point where she wanted to move, then opportunities open up that would allow her to move and then coming to the point where she had to move. And sometimes our body or something else in our lives lets us know you have to to make a move. And she talks about that and the importance of paying attention to that. So in this episode, you're going to learn when it's time to remove those golden handcuffs, as we talked about. Also, the difference between being exhausted from working hard and being joyless. Mitzi talks about that. How chance encounters can change everything. I am a big believer that when you're searching for the answer, when you're open to it, when you say this is something that I need to move in my life and you're in action, things eventually open up. How to know when you're coming to the end of a journey or a part of a journey. Things come into your life for different reasons. Sometimes it's just time to move on. Also, Mitzi says, don't take on someone else's baggage before you make a leap because you will have plenty of your own. And don't we all know that? The other thing she really talks about in very personal detail, which I so appreciate, is this idea that we underestimate the impact that stress can have on our bodies, especially as women, super women complex. We keep going, going, going. We don't want to stop. We can get through it because we've gotten through it before. Your body will stop you if it has to. And we have to pay attention to that before we get to that point. With all of that, it sounds heavy. I promise you, there are a lot of laughs in here. You're really going to enjoy it. Mitzi is a beam of light. I really, really love and appreciate her for sharing her story with such candor. So without further ado, Mitzi Miller. So Mitzi, thank you so much for joining us on Support is Sexy. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for including me. I'm excited. Sunshine. You look great. I have to ask you, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? I've always, in my mind, been my own boss. So I couldn't tell you a time that I fell in love with it. Even when I wasn't working for myself, I definitely admired and respected the people that I knew that were. I always saw it as like the ultimate act of courage. To kind of say, I don't need anybody else to sustain my livelihood. I'm going to make it on my own. Nice. Now, where did you, um, you grew up in Connecticut, you told me. I did. Stanford, Connecticut. Stanford. What was Mitzi like as a little girl? What was little Mitzi like? Girl, busy. I am so (laughs) sure. Busy. My poor mother. (laughs) I was was definitely a tomboy. Definitely um, love sports, love running around, would prefer to be outside, like tinkering under the car with my dad, who was a mechanic, as opposed to inside learning how to properly cook rice, which is why to this day I don't eat rice. Mm -hmm. Um, Despite my Latin background, I just, you know what, everybody is an able. Um, (laughs) But but, um, my mom was an avid reader. We literally lived down the road from a a library. Mm -hmm. And she impressed upon me the love of reading from a very early age. Like I wasn't allowed to watch TV after school. I was allowed to come home to my homework and then go to the library if there was still more time. So I was either playing sports or reading a book. Like Mm -hmm. 
it was either or. Like we were either riding our bikes and chasing each other around the neighborhood, or Mitzi was walking with a ten pile of books, higher than her head, couldn't see around it, to a quiet corner in the house. Like it was either or. Yeah. Did it make you fall in love with books at that time, or did it make you resent them? Because my mom, funny enough, was a librarian, and she would bring home books, and I'd be like, I want to write my own stories. You know what? I fell in love with the books and I would make up my stories, but it never made me want to write them. Like I just became this sort of, my mom even says, a griot. I love spinning stories. I loved like reading and falling into these completely different worlds and dimensions. And then I loved to come out. And I think actually what it did was it started my love of people watching. Mm -hmm. I'm an avid people watcher. Mm -hmm. Like I, it doesn't matter if I'm driving and God forgive me, like I will look at the person next car. I got your whole life story. I know where you're going. I know where you're coming from, the trauma that you just overcame. Like I love people watching and creating stories in my mind. That's what the library did for me and my mom. Yeah. And she would listen. She was like, as long as you don't sing, because you can't hold a tone for it, <laughs> you can tell me all the stories you want. You can talk my head off all day long. So who were your greatest influences growing up? Definitely my mom. It was my mom and my fifth grade teacher, mm. uh, Mrs. Wilson. And it's so petty why I love Mrs. Wilson. Why but do I love her? I loved her because Mrs. Wilson came to work every day laid out. Like, <laughs> she was so fly. Like, it made no sense. It, like, coach from head to toe. And looking back as an adult, now I'm clear Mrs. Wilson's husband was wealthy. Oh. <laughs> Wilson, I'd be like, oh, okay, hello. And she's <laughs> teaching us things like French and Italian and also reading. And she was, you know, really? This is <laughs> little kids in a, in a tiny Catholic school in Stanford, Connecticut, and being like, we're going to take a class trip to Germany and Switzerland. Like, Mrs. Wilson was so bigger than our little suburban town. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at her and being like, I want to be a teacher and I want to be that fresh because clearly all teachers have that kind of money. Right. To have I was going to say, Miss Wilson on her teacher salary. Right. <laughs> fresh to death from head to toe. Yeah. Obviously her husband was wealthy, but she was really, I mean, we read such amazing books and had such great discussions in the class about character. And it's, that's when I started to think about the creating my own stories and where the characters came from and how to create them in your mind and how to sort of follow them along the journey. And then my mom, because she was my best friend, she continues to be my best friend. And she's like my biggest cheerleader, like even when she's scared. And I give her so much credit for that because I don't know how good I would be if I was a mom and I got scared, mm -hmm. you know, like especially with everything going on. Even when she was like, yeah, I don't, I don't what do you, so you're not going to become a nurse? Because I thought that's what we agreed. We, we were going to go be a nurse and it's going to be safe, you know, get a job. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm just going to become this English major and figure it out. Right. She was like, because how does an English degree keep a check coming in your house? Like, but then she'd be like, okay, if, if this is what you want. Mm -hmm. This is what you want. So so you want to go to France and, and spend a couple months living with a family. Okay. You don't speak the language. Okay. No problem. I don't speak. <laughs> okay. You don't want to learn Spanish. Okay. No problem. <laughs> This is what you want. It, she would send me away to sleepaway camp and force us to like push our boundaries and really force us to consider so much more beyond Connecticut, beyond New York, beyond the United States. Um, always made sure we kept in touch with our family in Panama so that we were clear like you come from line, you, you didn't just show up. There's people behind you. There, the position that you're in is very blessed and favored and you need to be thankful for that. Where do you think she got that, um, I guess it's courage, really, to say, because I know I feel the same way about my parents, every crazy idea, they don't know what I'm doing, but at a point, they're just like, oh. okay, well, okay, <laughs> well, just tell us what what do we need to do? Subscribe to the podcast. Okay, how do I do, you know, whatever it is. I'm not sure, just press the button. Nope. Okay, mom, <laughs> no, no problem. It, button is pressed. I made your father press the button. Right. I went and pressed the computer so he could press the button. He don't know, do not, like, yes. Um I, you know what? It's interesting because my my mom has a brother, is the oldest of three. And she was always the most sheltered because in her family, there's a lot of like color distinction and she was the fairest. So my grandma never let her go outside, never let her have friends, was very strict and this conservative. Is Yes. Mm -hmm. Whereas my uncle and my aunt used to be out, popular, running the streets, having a lot of fun. And I think her rebelling against 
how strict her own upbringing was based simply on the fact that they wanted to keep her fair, Mm. made her push and try things. Like she left Panama to go to medical school. She went to Mexico City on her own at 16. I don't, I can't even imagine leaving home for medical nursing school in another country Mm -hmm. at 16 years old. But she was like, I couldn't stay any longer because it was just so difficult, you know, being at home and everything being so restrictive just for me. Um, and from, you know, from Mexico, she, she, it's her favorite story. You know, Mitzi, I came to this country with $25 in my pocket. Mm-hmm. No, you know, you, you kids, you got so much, you do so little. So it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, mom, you, you didn't really come here with $25. I need you to stop that. But <laughs> okay. The story sounds good, but. It sounds really good. So does the banana boat that you drifted over. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 but honestly, I think it was rebelling against how, how conservative and how strict my grandma was. So did she come from college here or the, to the United States? Yes, came straight. She was like, yeah, so we're just going to keep it going. She went right. from Mexico City to Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And um, that's where she actually met my dad. Yeah. Wow. So now do you think who you were as a little girl and um, loving books and loving to tell stories or create your own stories sort of transitioned into or led you into the career you ended up taking with journalism and having been an English major and those kinds of things? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I also think it was as a kid being observant and the people watching, I was always aware when I would go over um, my different girlfriends and guy friends' homes, whether or not their parents were happy or not happy. Hmm. Always very attuned to people's moods. So I could tell when somebody's mom or dad didn't like their job because they'd come home, they'd be short, they'd be slamming around, you know, like, got to come inside. You got Versus you go over other kids' house, dad come home with the brief, he laughing, he happy, life is good, big, you know, you could just tell. And certainly um, finance probably had a lot more to do with that than at the time that I understood. But what registered for me was like, I just don't want to be miserable. I've always said whatever I'm doing, I don't want to come home and be sad and therefore be un, like unhappy and mean towards the other people around me. Mm-hmm. And so I never really knew what I wanted to do. I love books and that gave me a lot of different ideas. In fact, I changed my mind probably as often as I changed my underwear. <laughs> so like depending on who I was around it, and, and it, whether or not they were a happy adult, that's what I wanted to do. If I met a doctor and she was nice, I wanted to be a doctor. If I met a fireman and he looked like he loved his job, I wanted to be a fireman. If an uh, astronaut, I wanted to be an ice skater, like a gymnast, all of these different things. It was all about... Can I, I want to be happy like this person. Right. That I'm, you were drawn that? to the happiness, not just what they were doing. It didn't matter it's, what they did as long as they were happy. No clue, which is why when mm-hmm. I got to FAM, it was actually a little nerve wracking because I genuinely was like, okay, I'm not going to make it out these biology classes. I can barely make it out of college algebra. Clearly, I'm going to be miserable trying to be somebody's nurse. Mm-hmm. Um, and I couldn't think of anything that I enjoyed doing more than reading. And that's why I wound up becoming an English major. I was like, oh, I'm just going to read books and write stories for the rest of my life. And yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go with that. Right. And did you know at that time that you can make a living, quote unquote, a living from it or a career? So many of us English majors had no idea. We just say, no, I just I just felt like that's what I needed to do at that time. And I was going to figure it out. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was really like, don't worry, mom, something will pan out. You know, I'll be a teacher. I'm going to become Miss Wilson. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> I'm going to become Miss Wilson. And it was interesting because so over the summers, back then you could just become a substitute teacher. When you went home, it was really easy to sign up. You get your little hundred dollars a day. You think you went in. Mm-hmm. I remember going to the schools and a couple red flags. One, the children were taller than me. <laughs> right. So I'm in the public schools and the kids were kind of like, attempting to bully me. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be fighting every day of my life as a teacher. These kids, this this ain't the same as when we were in school. They don't care about nobody. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing was, I didn't love it. Like, I enjoyed the one-on-one interaction with certain students, but the whole, the idea of the lesson plan, the big group trying to motivate when clearly it wasn't reaching everyone. It didn't, like, I didn't feel challenged by that. I didn't feel like, oh, I want to do it. I felt like, eh, maybe not so much. Right. But it's good that you got to experience that over the summer, like test the water, so to speak. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I knew I was like, 
unsure about the education, but I wasn't unsure about the English because I still enjoyed my coursework. I still enjoyed reading and writing and discussing. So I figured that I would just figure it out when it was all done. Nice. And, yeah. And you did. Uh, yeah. You know what? Somehow, somehow <laughs> this and the liver transplant kind of, kind of helped me figure it out for sure. Yeah. Right. Now yeah. you're a celebrated writer and you co-authored five books. Yes. Five, right? Including The Vow, which we talked mm-hmm. about a little bit. Um, and you were editor-in-chief of Ebony. I was. For how many years? That was two years? Girl, was look it? at you giving me all that credit. I was the editor-in-chief of Jet for about two and a half, almost three years, and Ebony for six months. Oh, Ebony, six months. Yes. I did give I gave you a lot of credit. You gave me a lot of credit. And but I, I knew Jet. That. You were in the, within the but company. I, you were I within was the walls. definitely in the company. And I honestly... I went to Chicago. I went to Johnson Publishing Company to become the editor in chief of Jet. Mm-hmm. My, fi- I grew up on Jet, but Ebony was in the house. If mm-hmm. you can, if you understand the difference, mm-hmm. I, come, I have two immigrant parents. English is their second language. We read Jet because it was short. It was to the point. And it was simplistic. Ebony was really pretty, a lot of big stories, but nobody had time. Nobody got time for that. Right. Like I would sit down with my dad every week and he we would read the jet together. So the jet. I was, the jet. The jet. So I was so excited and honored to it was just for the first time my dad really knew what I did. Right. Like when I said, Daddy, I'm going to be the editor in chief of Jet, he was like, Oh my God, oh my God, let me, let me help you back up. Gotta get you out of here. Hold on, hold on. I'm not leaving just yet. Like it was a really big deal. And while there were certainly, it was a huge honor to be the editor in chief of Ebony when people sort of like, Wow, you only did it for six months. Yeah, because it was, it was a time for change. And I also, in my heart, knew that I did what I came to do, mm-hmm. which was be the editor in chief of Jet. And I think that it, that was really important to me, honoring that inner voice that was like, listen, you can certainly do this job, but you're, this is not like, you're not going to be 100% happy here. There's more, there's something else, and it's, it's okay to, to step out on faith. That was my next question. How did you know when it was time to, to leave and step <laughs> out on <laughs> faith and move across country and all that good stuff? Right. You know what? It was... Um, It wasn't easy, right? Because you reach, you work your entire, as a journalist, being the editor in chief of Ebony Magazine, even Jet, that is the end goal. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't want to become the editor in chief of a major publication? And here I'd done Jet, and now I was at Ebony, and this amazing woman went before me, Amy, my um, Amy Du Bois Burnett, and I'm in this line of great people, and it's just all this, these golden handcuffs, Right. right? connected to this project but at the end of the day when I would go home and it was just me in Chicago and in those quiet moments I didn't feel the joy anymore it felt like a job Mm -hmm. and there's such a distinct difference between having a career and a job and there's always going to be hard moments. There's always going to be those periods where you're just like working your butt off and it feels like I'm exhausted. But that's completely different than when it feels joyless. And so when it started to feel like that, I knew I needed to do personal inventory. I needed to figure out, okay, what is it that you love? What's missing? Because I loved magazines mm-hmm. and I still do love magazines. But what I really, really love is telling stories. And I realized like, that's my passion. My passion is telling stories. That's why I enjoyed writing books. I enjoyed writing articles because it's about the stories. It was about the characters. And I just needed a new medium Mm -hmm. to do that in. I needed something where I not only felt challenged, but I also felt like I could earn, like start all over fresh and earn respect again. That's just the kind of person that I am. Like, I'm, I don't think that I would ever be comfortable sort of being complacent and going sleepwalking through a job or an opportunity. Mm-hmm. I want to be slightly challenged. I want to feel like I'm making a difference, not just for others, but also for myself. What did I learn today? What change did I get to affect? And so once I realized like that's what it is, it just clicked. Right. And again, and so 
I didn't start saying to myself, like, I want to work in TV. I want to work in film. What I said for literally almost a year leading up to me making the leap. So this actually started back at Jet was I want to be happy. Mm -hmm. I want an opera. I want a door to open. I want an opportunity to present itself where I'm telling stories and that and I'm happy. And so when I ran into Rob Hardy, who I now work with at Rainforest Entertainment, it was it was by accident that we wound up sitting together at a bar. Or it wasn't. By or it wasn't. Or the, the universe. design, right. Hooked it up that we wound up at an airport sitting at a bar catching up because we went to school together. So we knew each other from back in the day. Mm -hmm. And he's all congratulating me on, you know, all those successes that are going on. And I'm like, yeah, you know, because I'm about to wrap this up. And he was like, excuse me? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I love it, but I, I just feel like I know when I'm, it, I'm, I'm in the moment and things are going well. And I know when we're coming to the end of something. And I, I feel like there's another door that's about to open. And he was like, word? Okay. He's like, most people aren't that clear about it. I was like, you only I'm got clear. one thing. I'm clear. And so then he said, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. I think it's in TV and film. That's something that I've never explored. Um, but it really comes down to, I want to find great characters. I want to find amazing stories. I want to help writers put it together and I want to get it out there for the world. And I didn't, I didn't know if it was going to be via digital. I didn't know if it was going to be TV film. I was like, I want to spend my days reading and working with writers. Cause that's what I love to do. He was like, well, he's like, you don't want to like be behind the camera. You don't want to be on the camera. I said, I enjoy being on the camera. Don't get me wrong. Like again, nothing's ever off the table, but I really like the work. And he was like, well, it sounds like what you want to do is development. And I was like, okay, well, that's the name of it. That's I'm glad. I, right. Because I had no idea. Because I think growing up on the East Coast, we don't know the names and the responsibilities and the titles for all the things that happen on, in the industry that is homegrown in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And so once he gave me the name, I was like, all right, bet. And he was like, and you know, ironically, I'm looking for a new head of the de development. I shut down Rainforest for a year after Will and I split. And now I'm looking to start. I said, well, look no further. You found your girl. Wow. And this is at an airport bar. I said, the airport bar over an extra dirty martini. <laughs> extra dirty. <laughs> extra dirty. With I love it. Thanks, please. No, my, well, I just have to say there's so many, first of all, bravo or brava you um, for have, being self-aware enough to tap into that and being brave enough to say, I don't know what it is, which is something I think a lot of us get caught up on, especially women like, well, I want to do something else, but I don't know what it is. So you either push it off the table or you don't even express it to someone like in that moment, you could have gone either way and just said, oh, congratulations. Oh, thank you. And that would right. be it as opposed to actually I'm thinking about this and not being afraid to say, I don't know what it is, but this is what it feels like, or this is what I want to do. And that's come up with a lot of the women that I've um, spoken to. Yeah. But you have to talk, you have to be willing to expose yourself and not be afraid. And it is scary. You don't, cause sometimes it's a risk, mm -hmm. you know, I very much could have said that to Rob and then he could have turned around and told somebody else and they, they could have told somebody else and it could have gotten back to my boss that I was, thinking about leaving and I was unhappy. Mm -hmm. So obviously you have to be smart about it, but if you don't open your mouth, no one is going to know that it's not working for you. And the other really amazing thing that I don't take for granted is the people that I surround myself with, uh, both closely and indirectly. I know through three to five degrees of separation, people, women, every day making the decision to walk to find happiness. Mm -hmm. And that's what I choose to focus on. I know people that we all started in publishing and now we're like, we're all around the world doing completely different things because, you know, not because we sat there and said, well, all we have is magazines because we gambled on ourselves and our talent. Right. And I think it's Im so important to make sure that it's not just like your friends, even though that's vital, but like you make sure to have examples of people being courageous around you at all times right so you don't feel alone and you feel you have something to aspire to absolutely absolutely like it, it, i can i can always be like hey look look at elaine when i met elaine she was where you were at suede when we first met i think what? uh i think oh, essence. essence i was at essence, essence. Was before then essence. you jumped to suede which was huge and i was like that's so effing dope <laughs> and then 
like best magazine ever. And then you left there and you were like doing your thing and you went back in for Black Enterprise, right? I was, was at it? Black Enterprise. I was at Vibe. And then I think from there what? I went to digital. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's not, not that's not, that's a huge, that's huge. That's mm-hmm. you being like, yeah, you know what? Um, this ain't working. Right. So I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep going. And every time people land on their feet, every time somebody is willing to help. And when you continue to see people like that, even if they're not your best friends, even if they're not in your immediate sister circle, you know that it's possible. Doors open, but right. again, only if you open your mouth. Right. And say what you're, I, oh, girl, you're preaching to me. I need a fan over here. so now was that yes to rob over at the airport was that the yes that made you say okay this is a position this is what i'm going to do it wasn't just talk you in that point did you make that decision i was like oh no i'm out i was like i don't get on that plane (laughs) it's like it's over (laughs) so we wrapping it up chicago this this is the victory lap right here (laughs) it's funny because that conversation happened right after immediately after we did the redesign for jet Mm -hmm. so i was still at jet and oh. shortly thereafter, yeah, I was still a Jet, but it was like, Jet had just been redesigned. That's what I came here to do, the slow down. Then a little while after that, they offered me the Ebony. So I was like, okay, what, what's the lesson here? Mm-hmm. Don't never say no. So I was like, all right, I'll take it. Maybe Rob sends me to the, hey, congratulations. I saw you just took that. I was like, oh, don't don't be confused. We just getting our money up. Right. Um, yeah, <laughs> before, like, we la- before we launch. Before we step out on faith and go to this, like, two-man shop. Right. right? And he, we were talking the whole time, figuring out what it was going to look like, what I'd be doing, what a, getting a better idea of exactly what I was going to be doing. And sort of that balance where you're like, this is the day job, this is the dream job, and we got to get them as close together before you make the leap because nothing's perfect, but you still got to, right. you know, you got to, I would never advocate that people like run out cold, like they'd be on some like, ah, turn up, I'm out, blah, 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 right. zero in the bank. That's not what you're hearing from me. Be prepared, be clear, and be fearless. Right. But there are some steps around that. You, like, I don't believe that you just jumped from one job to the other on some like, yeah, I don't have no money today and I don't care what happens. You know, you were like, you know what? I'm going I'm to slow down on the spend and then I'm going to get a little salt cushion and then we're going we gonna to make the move. We're going to have conversations and see what can happen. Right. Like building, you were building your runway. That's what I always say. How long is your runway? Building your runway exactly. so you can take off. Exactly. I exactly. Love that. Especially in this this era now of just what you see on TV or social media or whatever. It's just this, oh, just throw up everything and do it and you can make it happen. And sometimes that works, but less yeah. often uh-huh. than not. Yeah, that's the exception. Exactly. That that is absolutely the exception. And I subscribe to the belief that I'm never the exception. <laughs> I, I'm I'm never going to be the you exception. Are the rule. I am the rule, so that requires me to work my behind off um, and be prepared. And if I'm going to have to work this hard, then I'm going to be doing something that I love and care about. And I'm going to do the research. I'm going to have conversations with people about it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to talk to people about their journey. What did that look like? And if this happens, what, what, what do you do so that I can prepare so when it happens to me, right. it's not a big deal. And I love what you said about getting your dream job and your day job, so, so to speak, to not meet, but that, that bridge between the two. Right, so right, in your position. mind. Right, and, and sometimes you need to create that runway to get your own courage up because mm-hmm. you know you're going to have difficult conversations with people that love you, and, not, and, and they're difficult for one reason, because they love you, mm-hmm. because they're scared. Like, a lot of times when people don't support us, it's not hate. It is, I don't want to see you get hurt. right. I know what it looks like to be out here unemployed, can't make rent, or I know somebody that that happened to, and I don't want that to happen to you. And you have to believe that because you're not the exception, because you're the rule, because you're doing the work, because you're preparing, it won't catch you. Right. That's true. I always tell people that too, especially when it comes to parents or just anyone who's trying to look out for you. It's usually out of love, not out of wanting you not to do certain things. Yeah, it's straight fear. They don't want you to fail. So you have to figure out and prepare to have those conversations where you can tell them, I receive your love, but I'm going to have to leave the fear with you mm-hmm. because I can't afford that baggage when I make this leap. Because you're going to have your own fear. Exactly. Get- you got your own baggage. Listen, it's, you, you're going to have your own sleepless nights. 
you're going to have the, your own moments where you're like, okay, okay. So I, okay. So there's no check this Friday. <laughs> right. So hmm. there's no payroll department to call to see what happened with that deposit. It's, so what with the health um, insurance, so that that's not covered. Okay. Right. <laughs> Got it. We're still going for, I'm still able, still going to figure out a way. You're going to have to go through all that. And that is very solitary. Right. <laughs> so don't take on anyone else's. Don't add to your burden. So how did you know, at what point did you say it's time to make the leap? Was there something that either happened or was it a certain amount that you wanted to get, a, amount meaning months wise that you wanted to have in a bank or what was it? You know what? I actually, my intention had been to stay at Ebony for at least a year. Um, and, and that was purely ego. I didn't want to say I only was the editor in chief of Ebony magazine for six months mm-hmm. because that could be interpreted so many different ways. Like, Oh, you didn't make it or whatever. And I never wanted people to have that question because it wasn't, I didn't leave because I couldn't do the job. Mm-hmm. I left because it was my t- it, it was time for me to go. Um, but I had an issue with my health. Um, I, I have, I'm a liver transplant recipient. And so my organs started to reject. And it's so interesting because all the years that I was in Chicago, I was seeing a male doctor at, at the transplant center, um, in Northwestern. And I would go in and I would tell him about my crazy schedule and he would see me having to cancel and reschedule appointments. And he would always just like laugh and, Oh, I saw you on TV and that's so great. And he would encourage me to keep going harder. And he would think it was, you know, you're fine. Your tests are great. Keep going. Um, and I would be like, I'm really stressed out. Like I, I'm not sleeping because everything is going on, but I love what I'm doing. He's like, as long as you love it, keep going. Mm. And about a month, two months before that I went, that I went into crisis and my liver started to reject that doctor left and I wound up with a female doctor. And so when my test results came back irregular, she called me in and she would not let me reschedule the appointment. She was like, no, I'm sorry. You've rescheduled this twice. You have, you have to, come, to in. come in. You have to come in. And I'm like, Oh God, who's this, like this not understanding woman. Does she know how difficult my job is? Like, does she, does she know I'm on the road all the time? Like she thinks I'm doing this purpose. I came in and she sat me down and she said, I need you to tell me about your life. Mm-hmm. And you tell me what is going on with you. What is different? And I was like, I honestly, I don't know. I mean, I'm doing the same thing. I'm, I'm trying my best. I'm, I'm exercising when I can. I'm taking my, I don't know. But like, how do we fix this? And she was like, and I gave her like a rundown of my day and mm-hmm. like what my life was like. And she said, I can't tell whether or not the irregularities are a result of a misfunction of your organ or just the level of stress in your life at this point. Mm. And she said, as a woman, you are under incredible stress and this is affecting your body and this is affecting your life. She said, because people underestimate how detrimental stress, yes. lack of sleep, lack of exercise and unhappiness can be to your body. And so she was like, we can adjust your medication, but as a professional, I would encourage you to really think about taking a medical leave because I think, because I can't tell. And I need to know if when you're rested, when you're actually okay, does this work for you? Or is it more something different? And you know, I looked at her like she was crazy. I was like, ma'am, I'm not about you know, that. Like I have a meeting. I can't, I can't <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> Listen, I was like, I'm already 10 minutes late for the, today's emergency. So I just, you know, sounds good. Um, I had Power 100 coming up. Right. Just was way too, I'm about to get on this plane. I don't have a dress. You don't know my life. Who's going to comb my hair for me? Like, <laughs> right. not today, not today, Satan. So I went to Power 100 and I came back and we had a long weekend. And I, it was Thanksgiving and I got so sick. I couldn't get on the plane and come home. Mm. And in that weekend, that Thanksgiving holiday that I had to spend in Chicago by myself because I was too sick to get on the plane to go home and see my friends and family, which is the only thing I ever wanted to do. Right. I I very rarely could get home because of our schedule. So holidays were like, oh, babe, like Thursday morning, Thanksgiving morning, I'm on that plane. Like to not be unable, it was just a come to Jesus for me. And I was like, this is, this ain't it. This is just, this is not it. And so I took her advice um, ultimately and I went on medical leave. I Mm -hmm. went on medical leave through the remainder of December. 
because I had it like literally, I want to say I had almost 18 vacation days still left because wow. I never took vacation. Yeah. And, um, the difference immediately, like there was just like, oh, that's what my head feels like when it's not going a million miles an hour thinking about something other than me. Right. <laughs> right. This is what it feels like to sleep through the night again. Mm. This is what it feels like when I can incorporate regular exercise in my life and I'm not losing weight from stress. I'm actually getting fit and losing weight from eating well and being healthy and cooking food. Like it just, it just started to come together. And at the end of, I was on, I went back um, to work for like a day to close out my last issue. And after that, I was like, yeah, so listen, I'm, I'm not coming back. This is not right. This is it. I was like, if it's between me and the, if it's between me and the casket, it's going to be me. I'm not, I'm not dying for someone else's dream. Right. right. I think a lot of times we're not still enough to listen to our bodies until it's too late. And there's so many little signs along the way. Like we, 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 we talk to our friends about the inability to lose the weight and we, and we bitch and we complain and I'm not summer body ready, but like for real, it's because we're eating horribly. When was the last time we cooked the food and, and sat down and, and had like a meal and really shared and took a breath and enjoyed it? Right. When was the last time we were able to consistently exercise? And Not stress that, keeps the weight on too. All the time. Like your hormones will hold on to all of that. Um, the weight, hair loss. Mm-hmm. We're always talking about our edges and our hair breaking and the, the eyelashes and the eye. All of that is, is the way we're living. Right. Right. Our skin breaking out. Like I, I was getting acne and I'm like, I will never have acne. There's a lot of things I have. Acne is not one of them. Mm-hmm. It'll break out. You'll be sensitive and you'll get colds frequently. All of these things we kind of brush aside and we keep moving and we take a little, you know, you take a little Robitussin, and you take a Sudafed, you mm-hmm. use this like, well, to go to, to sleep through the night. But all this would come together if we were breathing deeply. Like a lot of us couldn't, couldn't, you couldn't, if I asked you when was the last time you took a deep breath, you really probably couldn't tell me. Mm-hmm. And I don't just mean like inhale. I mean like when was the last time you pushed the air all the way through your body, forced yourself to feel it in your head and calmed your thoughts. Like right. we're so tapped in all the time. If we're not working, we're on social media, we're taking care of our families. We're always taking care of somebody else, doing something else, running somewhere. And we forget about ourselves. And as women, like, that's what your friend circle, that's what I always charge people in their friend circles to do. Like, keep your friends accountable for taking care, for Mm self-care. Like, when was the last time you slept in? I I, I know it's a million things to do, but then a million things going to be there tomorrow, and you might not. Right. So really, it was was that health scare. That that was it for me. Like, I just, I, I went through a lot to get this organ. And as much as I love the title of editor in chief, like you love it, being alive more, love being alive. I love waking up every day and nothing happened, like nothing hurting me, not feeling nauseous, mm-hmm. not having to go get do a blood test every single week. Like, so they, did the doctor was she like, I see a difference, or I can tell now this is what it. Yeah, at the end, like about three weeks into it, my number started to go down, and I went in to see her, and she was like you look like a totally different person. Mm. And I was like, yeah, because I made a decision. And you stepped away from it. And that's the thing too, not to be too afraid to step away. Like it's all going right. to collapse without you. Or even if it does, you have to take care of yourself. Because maybe, you know, things could have gone wrong at the magazine or wherever people work or their business. But it's sort of like, we can't, we can replace an editor-in-chief at Ebony. We can't replace will. you. And the thing is, they will. Not right. just right. At, at JBC, at any job. If it doesn't belong to you, you, you are replaceable. I know the, it's great to feel like you're not. It's great to feel like you're the only one. Right. But trust me, they'll figure it out and they'll move on. They won't necessarily forget you. They'll miss the impact that you have, but they, no, will, right. carry, they will carry on. Right. You know? Yeah. And um, you're right. Like, we, we hate stepping away. Even when we take vacations, we're not really stepping away. Yeah. We're so busy taking pictures on the beach. Right. <laughs> we're, so, we're so busy telling everybody that we're stepping away. That right. we can really step away. Right. 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 We're right. documenting our stepping away. Every step of the way, everybody knows we step. 
face. <laughs> Exactly. Or I like that's so funny because I think about the Beyonce concert, you know, everybody's going to see her. And some people, if you look at their timelines or whatever feeds, the whole concert is on their time. Did you? I I mean, that's and that's fine. You you didn't even watch her. I feel like I'm there with you. You know, it's just like, did you, you enjoy watch her your phone? You And you're actually there. You had great seats that you paid for. <laughs> and you watched her through your phone as it, the same as the people who watched as her on HBO. Exactly, exactly. You had the same experience I had sitting in my house. <laughs> it's so funny. But like you said, we just have to show people that we're there and what's going on. And nothing against that. But sometimes no, you have I, to stop like, okay, I'm putting my phone away. I recorded the first song. I recorded Formation. <laughs> <laughs> All the other it's, songs, I'm going to be present. Like, Right. It's almost like if we don't take a picture, it didn't happen anymore. <laughs> That's what uh, somebody actually said. Who said somebody? I can't remember. It was a magazine editor. Someone said, if it's not on Instagram, it didn't happen. And I was Stop. like, Whoa. Like you, you're right. Are you crazy? <laughs> Are you crazy? Like, like, I mean, I understand wanting to document because looking back, not having grown up in, in social media, I'm sort of like, dang, I wish I had more pictures of me in college. Or I wish I had pictures of me. Like as a kid, I wish we had more of those photos. But I'm also glad that I actually lived through college and have memories. Exactly. And I'm always telling my friends, yo, memories are the best pictures. Right. Like it, it, you, and when you think about how much time is lost preparing for events that never used to, you never used to have to prepare for. Case in point, dinner with your girlfriends. Before, you might slap on some gloss and a little bit of mascara, and you go on because the focus is the dinner and, and, and the being friends. With and girls. Fun, being with your girls, the environment. And and you know what I look like, and girls don't act like that. You know I have eyebrows <laughs> some days, and some days it's a little bit less, a little bit more, but it's fine. Now, I was like, hold up, because somebody going to take a picture. Right. <laughs> Let me build 20 minutes into my situation to look like I casually got here. When I didn't casually get here. Exactly. You know, if you can find the humor in that and kind of like stop that, you will save yourself time. That is time I could be sleeping. I could have been catching up on, exactly. uh, on, on, on Unreal. No, I'm in the bathroom trying to put a little highlight, put a little... <laughs> <laughs> just in case, just in case the selfie that you know is going to come comes and then everybody has to check it and make sure it looks fine. Approval, And then you get it on. And then for the rest of the night, nobody's focused on the conversations. Everybody's counting likes. Exactly. Like, it just becomes this, this whole this other thing. And, and again, it's the experience and it's fun to go through it. Yeah. But if every once in a while you just be like, hey, listen, so we're going to do brunch and nobody's taking no pictures. No just pictures. come. Come clean. Just come clean. Take My a friends and I have done that sometimes. Or like you take the pictures and that's it. No more. Don't post anything. Everybody's just here to have fun, have a good time. Right. No, we, no record of this experience. Right. Like I'll remember I was here with you. Right. Like I'm gonna remember what I ate. Okay. Right. <laughs> I don't need to put up take a like, picture of everybody's a, food. Oh, just, so we funny. just don't need all of that all the time. Right. Like. It's, yeah, it's funny. That's a, it's hilarious. I'm literally in tears. That's so funny. Now, uh, what is your so what is your day to day? Well, first of all, let me go back. I'm so glad that you stepped back and took that break and here with us and smiling and beautiful and taking care oh, yeah. of yourself. So I'm so happy about that. What is your um? what is your day to day? What is your day to day like now? Now that you're in L.A., we should tell everyone sunshine. Yes. Enjoying. Oh, I Yes, I I, 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 hooked, I I headed out west um, so that I could be closer to the studios and networks. And I am currently we don't have an office. And you're working um, with Rainforest and development. I'm working with Rainforest Entertainment. We talked about getting a, an office, but I was like, wait, I could get up every day and go to a building or I could just mosey into the second bedroom in my apartment. Right. Oh, okay. You know what? Why don't you put that money towards a raise? That's right. what we can do. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Now I work from home. So I do, I, I am really happy about the fact that I'm working from home again, happy to be part of the pajama mafia. Uh, <laughs> I might, you know, like I just recently actually started a new schedule. It's so interesting because I'm being mentored by this amazing woman. Her name is Corinne Huggins and she is actually Will Packer's TV development exec currently, but she's just like a tour de force. She's just a beast. And so she has helped me develop this new schedule where what I do is I'll get up in the morning and I will either go work out like first 
Mm -hmm. or I will read a script first and then work out. It'll be either or, but one script gets read in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then after that, um, I will say my prayers. And I know sometimes that's a little bit out of order, but if I get up, start saying my prayers, start moving around, I don't get my scripts read. Mm -hmm. So I need to plant my behind in my bed, read the script, and then get up say my prayers, give my thanks for being here. Um, and are these skips that you're, scripts excuse me, that you're reviewing to consider working on? or what is, mm-hmm. Well, some of them are to consider working on. Others are con- con- like trying to find writers. Mm-hmm. A lot of my job consists of finding projects as well as finding writers. So some are for project consideration, some are for writer consideration. After that, it is emailing back and forth, trying to meet the network execs, trying to develop relationships. I, I really am starting all over. Mm-hmm. And it's so odd because I feel like I know everybody in the publishing industry like the back of my hand, but TV is a totally different beast. Mm-hmm. So that's been actually fun because I've been meeting a lot of really great, smart people that have a lot of different agendas. So it's interesting to see what is the end goal for different people. What are they looking for? What do they want? Um, and then working with the people on the projects that we've acquired and sort of working with the writers. Mm -hmm. Where are you? How's that going? What are you thinking about? And then currently we're preparing to go in and pitch a new series. So that's this week. This week we will be getting Mm -hmm. ourselves together for these meetings, you know, working with the writers on the pitches, what everyone's going to say in the meeting. So we seem organized and yeah. So two things that you mentioned. One, I'm sorry I interrupted you talking about your day because I do want to hear about after you do your script reading and your Mm -hmm. your exercise. And the other is having a mentor and how important that's been to you and finding her. So about your day first. Right. Okay. So, yeah. So after after the morning either workout or script read, then I do the prayers of gratitude because I'm just excited, very happy to be here. And I think that no matter what your faith is, having some sort of grounding in spirituality and just recognizing every day, even if it is just running a moment to say like, thank thank you, Laura, for whoever you're thinking, I woke up today. Mm -hmm. Nothing hurts. Everything's working. All right, let's go. Mm -hmm. It can be more detailed than that, or it can be as simple as that, but you didn't have to, you didn't have to open up. The eyes didn't have to open up today. So we're here. What are we going to do with the day? After that, it is working on the projects um, that we are currently in development, whether that's working with the writers or sort of fleshing out the ideas a little bit further, working on the creative, the descriptions, creative is descriptions of the projects. Um, it is networking, setting meetings with the different studios ex- as well as the agents um, in the television and film industry. The agents are the gatekeepers. They're the ones that have the talent, be it the writers, be it the actors, be it the producers, whoever. So you have to be cool with the agents for them to send you their people. Mm -hmm. Um, So I spent a lot of time doing that. And um, yeah, that, that's really my job packaging, bringing the pieces together. Like if people, when people ask me, what do I do in development? I put the packages together so that we can take them out and sell them. Mm -hmm. And it's all production. And it's very similar to what I did at a magazine. Like I'd find, you come up with a story idea, you flush it out, you find the right writer for it. You figure out how to make them work for you. Figure out, you know, like, what can I give you so that you're going to do this? Then you write the piece. You create the piece. Then you, in magazines, the difference was I was on staff and I knew where it was going to go. Here, I have to take it out and try to sell it. Right. I love that. So now you guys have a big show coming up or a new show coming up called The Yard on BET. Yes. So is that one of the projects that you saw through development and help bring about? Well, actually, Rob had the yard set up at BT a number of years ago, almost three, four years ago, and then it kind of stalled. So I, my contribution genuinely was like going in and having the conversations with the executive at BT, being like, hey, you're actually sitting on this. Let's talk about why it's even more relevant today than it has been. So he does credit me for that. Like, he's like, listen, without you, this would still be sitting somewhere in the archives. Mm-hmm. And, and so that was a lot of fun. Like, pushing it and being like, no, 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 don't forget about it. I know you have a million properties, but this matters now. And so we've shot the um, pilot, what's yeah. going to be the pilot episode, but it is a MOW backed into series. So sort of like being Mary Jane, where it's going to be a two hour movie of the week. Okay. And then that will lead to the series. And what's being projected right now is that the MOW will air sometime at the end of October, November. Perfect. And then the series will start in January. Nice. Very good. So now as, and you'll be co-executive producer on that? 
Yeah, I will be getting a co-EP credit. So I'm super excited about that. It was a lot of fun. The Yard is essentially, when we, when we think about tone, the way Rob would describe it is like Friday Night Light set it at HBCU. Mm, nice. And, and, and as told through the eyes of the new, incoming new college university president who is played by Anika Noni Rose. Yes. And a cast of six incoming freshmen. And they're like young, beautiful actors, super talented. And so it was great being a part of like the casting process and going down to Atlanta to shoot it. We shot on Morehouse and um, Morris Brown's campus. And Atlanta is a character in the story. It's just, it was a lot of fun. And I'm excited about it. And I think more so than ever, I, as a graduate of HBCU, I'm excited to be able to show people why HBCUs matter. Right. Why that sort of environment with all this dysfunction, with all this craziness, its ups and downs, it, it's important and it, it, it's a safe place for all, not just our kind, but also it's, it's becoming diversified. So you have a diverse multicultural campus, student body, and, and just how in that small cosmo everyone is getting along and making it happen. Mm-hmm. HBCUs matter. <laughs> Girl, they matter listen. more than ever. Listen. I love it. So tell us about now your mentor. Um, you said that she's someone who, who works with uh, Will Packer yes. and has really been influential to you. In what ways has it been important to have somebody like that? So her name is Corinne Huggins, and I didn't know her till I got out here. And I took a meeting with her in informational just because we do the same job. And I'm always wanting to have conversations with other women that are successful at what they do. And we immediately hit it off. And it has been, there is, there are no words to explain how helpful it has been having someone that's walked this road ahead of me, be willing to share and guide and not in a, and in a very frank kind of honest, like, listen, this is going to work. That's not going to work. We're going to help you because you know what, this is what we do here. Mm. Black people, we help each other here. Like, yes, Hollywood is cutthroat as I don't know what, and there's different types of honesty and authenticity to the people, but for the most part, the, pe- the people of color help one another. And they're the younger, like the younger, I hate to say younger kids, but they're like in their 30s, so they're young kids to me. <laughs> but they're very, but like the Issa Rays and the Lena, um, I'm going to start to say Lena Waithe. Night, Lena Waithe. Like, they're so brilliant and they're so smart and they're so committed to getting our stories told and helping one another and doing it on their own so that if someone tells them no, it's fine. We have our own platform. Right. We're going to put it out there. And when you have that sort of mentality, then the networks come knocking. Then the studios come running because they see that, oh, wait, they don't need us. Right. You know? And they're building and so- an audience without us. Completely and totally. Mm-hmm. And that honestly, that's why Issa Rae has the HBO deal today. Because she was like, oh, wait, you don't want to do it the way I want to do it? Oh, then Insecure doesn't have to be here. Right. And as soon as she said that, they were like, wait, 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 hold wait, on. Wait, no, no, just kidding. <laughs> our, our bad. Our bad, actually. Right. Um, and so it's, but Corinne has really been, in terms of the day-to-day tactical, how to be effective, those kind of things that a lot of times you would think people wouldn't want to share how to navigate in a room, how to make an impression and what kind of impression needs to be made for it to stick. She's been very forthcoming and that's been absolutely priceless. Yeah. Like you're never too old to have a great mentor. Exactly. That's what I tell people all the time. And your mentor could be either, it's not about age. It's more about their experience in an area that you either are going into or want to go into. Mentorship can come in so many ways. Absolutely. And, and you may just need a little strengthening, you know, iron, iron sharpens iron. So. Right. That's right. Yeah. Now, you mentioned a little bit about your um, your transplant years ago, and I know you posted on Facebook recently that it's the 18th anniversary. Yes. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. And you said you consider this your um, your second life, having yes. had a transplant. How do you make the most of this second life? One day at a time, dude. Um, I, I live... I'm so aware that I don't have to be here. Like you only had to flatline one time for me to get it. Thanks. Message received, Lord. And um, how, but tactically it is every day matters. Every, every decision matters. The little things matter. Like I really attempt not to brush off the little things. I don't let it get me down, but I'm aware of them. Like it's a, it's a sunny day. 
I'm thrilled about that. That mm-hmm. alone is enough reason to be happy. I feel like every day you get up and you make the choice because being happy is work. Mm-hmm. Don't, there's nobody out. I don't know anybody that's just naturally optimistic. I think that's a crock of crap that they sell us so that you feel like, oh, I guess I'm just not that person. No. The people that are happy got up today and were like, you know what? In spite of everything going on, I'm still going to look for the, for, the, for the silver lining. I'm still going to be okay because right. I'm lucky to be here. And so I think operating from that position of gratitude and also being present in my life is how I honor this second time around. And one of your things is uh, one of your hashtags that you've been doing for many years is choose happy. Yeah, man. <laughs> right. Because you don't have to be. Right. You, you, life is hard. Like there's always something that you can get upset about that you can feel over, be made to feel overwhelmed by. There's always going to be something that's not going to go your way. So you can choose to focus on that or you can choose to focus on, I'm good. I'm happy. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. There's a lot of people that are just simply not here. Right. That's what I say. Sometimes, you know, that's all you got. Money might not be right. The job mm-hmm. might not be right. Business might not be flowing. Relationship, really- whatever. But you're right. here. You you're got here. another chance to get it right. Every day is a new opportunity to start over. That's right. Amen to that. A couple more questions for you, and then I'll let you go back to your sunny day in Cali. <laughs> what's, um, what's the greatest lesson having a business or working with a small business has taught you about yourself as a woman? I think that the greatest lesson, having been an entrepreneur, because I worked for myself for a number of years after I left Jane, um, before I went out to Chicago for Jet, and also working at a small business is you value your opinion. You value your own expertise. Because if you don't believe in you, then who's going to? Mm -hmm. When I give my opinion to Rob, when I weigh in on something, I have to believe it. And I have to believe that it's going to work because I said it's going to work. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes when I'm caught, when you're caught up in the machine, you you have 50 million people to go to, to, to give yeah, 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 that's great. That's great. That's great. You sort of learn when you're working on your own. I'm my own. Yes, man. I'm my own hype man. It starts here mm-hmm. because when you're okay with you, everything else can be turned around. True. Very true. So one last question before we go. Um, if you think over your life and your career and you had a chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would it be and what would you say? Only one? Only one. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go back to my mom because I always go back to Elsa and everybody knows this. So I would thank Joyce E. Davis. Mm. Um, Joyce was my first boss at Honey. I was her intern. She was the entertainment editor, and I came in as an intern, and I had boundless energy. <laughs> like, I was just like, I'm so happy to be here. I'll do whatever. And Joyce was like, okay, cutie, I'm going to need you to sit down, and we're going to get you some work to do. Right. And Joyce didn't give me busy work. Joyce gave me real work. Joyce saw something in me, a willingness to learn. I, I mean, somewhat of a talent, but really like a willingness to figure it out. Because again, I was an English major. I was never on the newspaper. I never write for a magazine. All that is self-taught. All that is, you need to go read the magazines that you like and figure out what they're doing that works and how to, how to make that work for you. Right. She was patient, she was kind, and she shared. And she didn't have to. She let me go to events when she could have been like, all right, good night. I'm going, to, I'm going to this puppy party. She was like, no, girl, I'm good. You go to this party. You enjoy it. And you meet five people there. Mm. Come back, tell me who they are, what they do, and why they matter. So I wasn't just kicking it. I was also being taught how to effectively use these events and these networking situations. And she has consistently, through the years, always supported me. She's never been unkind. She's never, she's always been fair. She's been honest. She's criticized me when I need criticism. She's pushed me when I've been like, Oh, it's too much. Really? Is it, is it really too much? Mm -hmm. Joyce was the first person that I saw walk away from publishing. She left. 
she was like, you know what? I'm about to be, I don't even remember. She might've been 35. She was like, I'm good. I love magazines, but I want to live life. I want to have a family and I want to pursue other things that make my heart sing. And she left. She went back to Atlanta. And now she's like some exec person at Spelman, like still telling stories, still influencing and mentoring people. But she has this very full life. And she didn't immediately jump into that role. Like she went to Atlanta. She started freelancing for Upscale. She did different things. I don't even remember all the different, but it just, I was like, wow. Like, you can walk and be okay. Right. It's not just okay. You can be great. You can have what you want. And it doesn't have to be the way people serve it to you. You can mm. figure it out. So I would definitely thank Joyce for that. That's beautiful. I hope she hears this. That was beautiful. I, so. I thank love you. it. She knows I love me some Joyce. <laughs> love it. <laughs> so, Missy, what's a way that we can support you? Of course, we're going to be looking out for the show. I'll get any information that you can share about it and put it on your page with your notes for this episode. But anything else? Social media, as we talked about a lot. Yeah. Anything There's- else? Right. There's also there's always, you know, you can keep up with me on social media. But in terms of support, it's definitely going to be the yard. Um, if you see I have a speaking engagement, I'm really bad at self-promotion. But if I mention it, tell a friend. <laughs> if I mention it. Right. If I mention it, tell a friend. Tell, if you're looking for a speaker, think about me. Because honestly, that is a part of our job and our position that I love. And I think a lot of us don't really think about how much we enjoy being able to motivate and speak and inspire others because it comes so naturally. Um, so, yeah. And where can people get in touch with you? Will it be on your website? MitziMiller.com? Yep. Okay. I'll make sure so we do a link to that. MitziMiller.com. And I'm on Twitter. At, what am I on Twitter? At Mitzi Moments. At Mitzi Moments. I'm on Instagram. At Del Carmen 75 I use my middle name for that. And, uh, yeah, I'm not snapping as much right. as I should. So don't bother trying to find me there. Right. <laughs> You're not snapping am, yet. I'm at Mitzi Moments. You can follow me, but I, I rarely snap because again, like I'm so busy enjoying today. I right. don't really, I don't have time. to. I you haven't have figured out I about incorporate it. the video to tell you how much I'm enjoying today, but I'm going to get on it. I'm going to get on it. And I'm definitely on Facebook. I have a, I have a page. I love it. Thank you so much. You know, I love you. You're such a great, oh, such a great you. energy. And I'm going to come out and visit you. Don't. Please here's come. what people need to know about me. Don't invite me if you don't really want me to come because I, I will show up. You please come. There <laughs> is a, a beautiful queen size air mattress. I uh, love it. <laughs> Listen, come because the second the second bedroom is officially an office, but I got an air mattress. I got a comfy couch. I love and it. It's a great view and life is for living. You know, life is for the living. So let's do it. That's beautiful. Now, what's a parting piece of advice you have for us? I think more so than ever, we all need to be present, be attuned, not just to what's going on around you, but really take the time to listen to what's going on inside of you and how you feel and be, be like respectful of that inner voice. Cause, cause that's, that's the one, that's the one that's going to lead you to where you, where you need to be. Respectful of that inner voice. Mitzi, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Have an awesome day. And definitely, you know, everything we talked about, especially with the script, please follow up. Okay. Hold on one okay. second. All right. Thank you so much for listening to that episode of the Support is Sexy podcast. And I do hope that you got some inspiration from it. And the challenge is for you to do at least one thing. Take one thing from the episode, at least one thing. You can always do more, but at least one thing that will help you move one step closer to your dream. Whether that's launching a business, writing a book, whatever that thing is that you want to do, take something from this episode and move one step closer. And what I'll also ask of you, if you can tell me what you think about the episodes, what we've been doing, what you want to hear what you like, what you experience while you're listening, go over to iTunes, leave us a review and let me know what's going on. What are you thinking? What are you feeling about the show? What else can I do to be of service to you, which is what this is all about, to be of support to you. That's our buzzword, right? You can also go to my website, elainefluker.com slash podcast. So that's E-L-A-Y-N-E. 
F-L-U-K-E-R dot com slash podcast. Hear more episodes there. Also have a bunch of great videos, tons of information. It's where I'm going to be spending a lot of time and it's where I'd love to connect with you. So again, thank you so much for listening. I truly appreciate you and your support. And the most important thing I want you to remember is having it all does not mean doing it all alone. So now go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.